So the healthier your gut is, the better you will handle hormones. And then also, you know, I support liver health while we're cleaning up the gut because the two, you know, our systems are never in isolation. They're always working in conjunction with each other. The information provided in this podcast is educational and not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Are you struggling with bloating, gas, constipation, and fatigue, but don't know what's causing these problems? The Gut Health Reset Podcast with Dr. Anne-Marie Barter dives deep into the root causes behind these issues that start in the gut. This podcast will give you the knowledge you need to heal your gut and reset your health. Esther, it is great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, Emory, it's great to be here with you again. Well, I'm super psyched about the, the questions that we're covering today and the topic. So I want to just dive right into it. So we're really talking about hormones and gut bacteria today. So what role does the bacteria in our gut play in regulating hormone levels? So there is a subset of your microbiome actually called the estrobolome. And the job of those subset of bacteria is to help your body metabolize and detoxify estrogen. Um, and so if you ever do stool tests, like a GI map on yourself, and you're looking at your beta glucuronidase and that's elevated, you know, that's usually a sign that your estrobolome are not functioning optimally. So you want to make sure that you're really fueling your gut, not only with um, anti-inflammatory nutrients, lots of bright colors in your fruit and vegetables, lots of variety in your diet because the gut loves variety um, and different food, just like humans, you know, we get bored eating the same thing over and over. Your gut it craves variety too, lots of fibers, lots of protein and quality fats. But also you really want to be careful, especially when you are approaching perimenopause and menopause to really mind your alcohol intake, because alcohol is not only disruptive to the gut microbiome, but it can raise your circulating estrogen levels for up to six hours after you have one cocktail. So you really want to be careful um, to not be in an estrogen dominant state. And if you're currently a regular, a regularly menstruating female listening to this, um, you want to make sure that you're also watching your alcohol if you, especially if you are estrogen dominant, because that can really continue to keep you there. Yeah, that kind of just blows a hole in the it's just a couple drinks kind of a you know yeah. thought process. So why do we care if we have super high estrogen levels? Mm. Super high estrogen levels can make you pretty miserable. Um, lots of breast tenderness, irritability, um, moodiness, bad cramps, heavy periods, blood clots, uh, you know, passing through. And so it's really not fun uh, to live that way. Month after month, it can be debilitating for lots of women where they feel like they can't get out of bed for one or two days a month. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we are detoxing and metabolizing estrogen and it's not building up. And also, if you are on bioidentical hormones, then you also want to make sure that you're really careful regulating your estrogen levels. Um, it, you know, it, you don't want to be in an estrogen dominant state when you're on bioidentical hormones either. The same symptoms can happen. So I, and what about weight with estrogen? Mm -hmm. Yes, weight, absolutely. That's such a great point. I neglected to mention, uh, but yes, it can make weight loss very challenging if you're estrogen dominant. It just turns you much more into a fat storage uh, machine than a fat burning machine. So the the ratio, when you have the right ratios of estrogen to progesterone to testosterone, that's kind of the really magical cocktail where you can build muscle and lose body fat. And, uh, but being an estrogen dominant state can, you know, alter cortisol levels and make it really hard to burn fat. Well, so that brings a great point up when you said HRT, really watch your ratio, see what's going on or hormone replacement therapy or bioidenticals, whatever you're doing. Um, 
I don't, I don't know about you, but one common problem that I see or a common question that I see in practice is, Hey, I went on, I went on bioidenticals. I went on hormone replacement therapy and I gained weight. And that's exactly what you're speaking to. And Mm -hmm. I can't lose it. Is that correct? Yeah. Some people gain weight on HRT for the majority of people. It's a couple pounds. It's not, you know, I'm talking three pounds, five max. Um, Three months is really the magic window for that when your body adjusts and the weight does come up. I can tell you personally, when I started adding in, you know, just progesterone, just an, a bioidentical progesterone trochee, you know, my breasts definitely went up a size and were huge and painful. And I was like, what is going on? And, you know, I treated myself and worked with my doctor and went on um, nutrients to just help my liver push them down a more optimal pathway. So I went on B complex and, um, cruciferous concentrates like Brussels sprouts and kale in a supplement form. Um, and you know, really I don't drink caffeine and I'm careful with alcohol. And then I noticed a significant shift, all the breast tenderness and the swelling went away for other people, however, who really do gain a lot of weight and don't lose it. You know, you need to do some investigative work and some testing. I not only use the GI map in practice, but I also use the Dutch test. This is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. And it's going to look at phase one and two of your detoxification pathways and see how you're methylating, see how your liver is moving the hormones through, or if it's moving through, if your ratios of estrogen are much higher than your progesterone then you may not need estrogen initially. You may actually need to, if you're in perimenopause, not menopause, but you're in perimenopause, you might need some DIM, that's diendomethyl. These are concentrates of cruciferous vegetables. Um, And you may need to just add in progesterone first to oppose that estrogen. And then phase three of detoxification happens in your gut. So you have to make sure you're pooping every day. I would, you know, eat, fibers that are going to bind hormones and pull them out like chia or flax seeds or chia pudding or flax pudding, you know, getting those nutrients in there can really make a huge difference in your diet uh, and pardon me in your hormone balance um, so that you do metabolize hormones and they are given in the correct ratios. And once you start HRT, you do need to work with a doctor and get your blood tested, you know, from your initial um, start, you need to get your blood checked within six to eight weeks. And then every three to four months thereafter for the rest of your course on hormones, it's like thyroid medication. You know, you've got to make sure that the hormone is saturating at the tissue level and it's no different for estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And with estrogen, with hormone replacement therapy, you do want to make sure that your levels are really saturating your tissues just for bone density benefits and cognitive benefits and heart disease prevention. So it can be really beneficial. The other thing you may want to consider if you're gaining weight on hormones is the quality of the hormones. Are you on synthetic? Um, Are you on bioidentical? And bioidenticals have a very different function physiologically. They're much more compatible. Um, They hit up progesterone that is bioidentical, hits up the dopamine receptors in the brain and quells anxiety, takes that edge off that meno rage that we get. And synthetic progestins do not touch brain biochemistry. So it's really important that you look at the quality. Um, also, you know, synthetic HRT is often given in a pill form that has to pass through your liver and gut. But if you're on a bioidentical, you can often have different delivery systems that bypass the liver and gut and absorb. So either topical in a form of a cream or a gel or a patch, and then progesterone you can give as a trochee that dissolves, um, between the cheek and the gum at bedtime. And so that really helps with sleep too. So There's all sorts of tweaking that really needs to occur for a lot of people with HRT. It's not uncommon, but you do, you know, circling back to this conversation, you do want to make sure your gut and your liver are really functioning optimally first. 
So we really have hit high estrogen levels and what we're seeing with that. What happens yeah. to our microbiota and um, low estrogen levels? What are we going to see? With low estrogen levels, you can see an increase in bloating, um, gut permeability, reflux, because uh, estrogen and progesterone really protect the integrity of the gut wall. I often see an uptick in H. pylori as well. Um, and H. pylori loves to suppress the production of stomach acid because stomach acid, hydrochloric acid acts as a firewall and it keeps out candida and it keeps out H. pylori and it keeps out, you know, uh, harmful bacteria that uh, pathogenic bacteria that otherwise should not be there. And once H. pylori sets up camp, it totally imagine like, turning a faucet off. So all the water dries up, right? So H. pylori can just happily camp out and make a home there and welcome in as well, all the candida and pathogenic bacteria. And um, so once, as long as, you know, if you're going through perimenopause or menopause or, or you're estrogen dominant and you're seeing a real imbalance in your gut health, then again, first you want to eliminate H. pylori. You may want to, uh, that's phase one. You may want to also then do kind of an antimicrobial broad spectrum um, antifungal protocol. And I'm using only nutrients with these, not drugs. Um, and then phase three is really rebuilding the gut wall, repopulating with stomach acid, um, giving high doses of probiotics and lots of anti-inflammatory healing and sealing um, nutrients. You know, there's and foods, there's slippery elm, there's marshmallow root, there's glutamine, there's zinc carnosine. All of these nutrients really help repair and restore gut health. So what does someone do if they're like, oh my goodness, I have low, high estrogen, I have low progesterone, I have low testosterone, and I have gut issues. Like, what, what do I do? Where do I start? And how do I go down this road and, and really tackle this? So the healthier your gut is, the better you will handle hormones. So um, we do, I do a combination. Um, first, again, I restore gut health, right? We weed and reseed and, you know, clean out. Um, the bacterial imbalances that don't belong there and heal and seal up the gut wall. Um, if someone has high beta glucuronidase, they've got a lot of inflammation, they're not detoxing estrogen well. Um, depending on where they are in their menopausal journey, um, you know, again, we can give cruciferous concentrates to help push estrogen down the right pathways can certainly give a B complex. I feel like every person should be on a B complex once they're on hormones, but I just love it for adrenal health and energy and stress management anyway. Um, and then also, you know, I support liver health while we're cleaning up the gut because the two, you know, our systems are never in isolation. They're always working in conjunction with each other. So eating lots of cruciferous vegetables really important. So the brassica family, foods like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, radishes, um, artichokes are also really beneficial. Kale is beneficial. Uh, so eating really good quality vegetables to support liver detoxification is really important. I'm a big fan of cooking your own bone broth. Um, I have a really simple recipe. I call it Esther's banging bone broth. And um, it's really just, I either get chicken feet, I get like two to three pounds of chicken feet, or I get two to three pounds of knuckle and neck bones from beef um, or really any animal. You can go to a butcher that sells pastured meats, or you can buy them online, you know, Whole Foods, you can find lots of sources of bones from pastured animals. And I throw it in a slow cooker. I dump over a quarter cup of vinegar. If it's the, if it's beef bones, if it's chicken, I cut up, uh, you know, two lemon halves, throw that in because the acid pulls the collagen and trace minerals out of the bones into the broth. And then I'll throw in a couple carrots and onions, some celery, um, parsley, 
if it's chicken broth, I love dill and water and a tablespoon and a half of sea salt. And I just cook it on low for 19 hours. And you want to cook it on low because high heat or boiling destroys and breaks the collagen strands in there. So by the time my meat broth is done and cooled, and I put it in a mason jar in the fridge, it turns into meat jello. Like I can stand a spoon in there. It's so nice and thick. And so that, that collagen is so rich in glycine and um, amino acids, and it really heals up and seals the gut wall. So, um, you know, also if your gut's really inflamed, you may want to stick to more cooked vegetables or steamed or roasted or pureed like in a soup. Um, because that's just a lot easier for your body to digest while you're transitioning and healing your body. And also periods of fasting, like intermittent fasting can also be really nice for the gut because you're not continually exposing your gut to food that it has to process and metabolize. So being really gentle with your gut can be super helpful. Um, and just one other thing I want to mention that really doesn't get talked about a lot is putting your body in a sympathetic state when you eat, okay? Most of us are just chowing down quick, hustling on the run, have to get to work, have to get the kids to school. You know, I call that dashboard dining where people are like eating in their cars, traveling all day, working, working, working in front of screens. Your body is in a fight or flight state in those times. So when you're in a state of fight or flight, the last thing your body really wants to do is send blood to your stomach and your intestines to digest. It wants to send blood to your extremities to run like hell from all the danger that it's perceiving from your brain and your nervous system. So taking about three deep breaths before you sit and eat, sitting down in front of a meal, put your phone in a different room, it will transform your eating experience, but also improve your digestion. Awesome. And I love that we, we've we kind of roped everybody together, uh, pre-menopause, perimenopause, menopause, it's kind of all been roped in there. But I want to just take a second and separate out menopause because I think it's just a big shock when women hit menopause. It's like, what what is going on? Why doesn't anybody talk about this? I didn't really realize what I was going to experience. This is kind of a big surprise. So what happens if you have suboptimal gut function going into menopause? Yeah. And this is why I wrote my book, See You Later, Ovulator, because it tells you everything you're going to need to know to get through menopause. Um, so if your gut is suboptimal, yes, you're not going to detox your hormones well, you're going to feel really inflamed and you can actually feel worse if your gut is and your liver is not in a great place. So if I work with someone and they do have a fatty liver and their detox pathways and their gut function are really subpar, we don't even introduce hormone therapy until the big rocks are cleaned up. You've got to you know, you can't, I always say you can't out hormone your lifestyle choices, right? You have to have functioning gut health. You need to eliminate a poop every day, once or twice a day. You can't be constipated and backed up because your hormones will get backed up if they are not exiting your body. You know, hormones should be like a gently moving stream and just keep what you put in must come out. They should not be like a stagnant pond just sitting there. So if your gut health is subpar, you know, you're going to feel worse. You're, you can still stay in a very estrogen dominant state, or you can have a lot of weight gain, or you can feel more irritable or, you know, all, all sorts of side effects. Some people say, you know, their emotional state really changes they describe themselves as going crazy, which we never want anyone to feel that way ever. That's never the goal. And I also want you to think about, again, your delivery system. And I just want to take a minute to be very careful. I really do not recommend hormone pellets for this very reason, because hormone pellets 
are, you know, A, it's a surgical procedure. They have to physically be, you have to, the doctor inserting them has to carve out a little tunnel in your tush it, under the skin to insert these pellets. There's not a single clinical study done on pellet, hormone pellet therapy. It is very expensive. And what happens is it jacks up your hormones to a very high level, which will have you feeling amazing at first. Um, for some women, for other women, like the clients I see, they come to me frustrated because they've gained 10 pounds, what feels like overnight on pellets. Um, they felt great initially, but, um, you know, and their energy really improved and cognitive function and mental focus improved. But then the minute those pellet levels start to decrease, you feel crappy again. You feel the withdrawal, even though your hormone levels are so much higher than your, your actual baseline. So when you do go on HRT, it should be given at a dose that's about a fifth of what a birth control pill should be. We don't need our bodies to be have a robust um, hormone curve and a robust progesterone bump to carry a baby at this point. You don't need to ovulate. You don't need to carry a baby. So it's just enough to um, offset chronic disease and help you get your energy and your vitality back. So, you know, yes, you want your gut health to be optimal before you start, but you also want to make sure you're on the right dosage, the right delivery system that's really compatible with you. And bear in mind too, you're nobody, people don't always get it right on the first try with hormones. There is an adjustment period when you go on. And if you start in perimenopause, which I'm a huge proponent of, by the way, to offset your menopausal symptoms, then as you go into menopause, you're still going to need to readjust. Like you'll feel really amazing for a while. And then when your estrogen starts to bottom out, you're like, oh my God, I'm exhausted all over again. Go back to your doctor, have your doctor adjust your dose. You know, it's, it's a bit of a moving part. Your, your body will lead you in this process. So your job is to partner with your body and partner with a good prescribing physician. So you feel really good in the process. So why do we gain weight in menopause? Previous to, why are we gaining weight? It, the diet's yeah. the same, the exercise routine is the same. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the biggest most frustrating comments that I hear from women, like yeah. what is going on? Mm -hmm. So as your estrogen and progesterone and testosterone decline, your insulin levels start to fluctuate wildly. You are far less insulin sensitive. It's like the second half of your cycle, right? When you're menstruating, that PMS phase can be really wicked for a lot of women, right? We get our cravings, we get irritability, we're exhausted. That's what happens full-time in menopause for a lot of women. They experience those symptoms. So um, we, again, we get cravings. Um, our cortisol also can come up and be, um, you know, it, once you're in a cortisol dominant state, you're going to get that muffin top or your muffin top turns into a cake top. So, um, you know, you really do need to manage your insulin and cortisol. And the good news is, you can do a lot of it with diet. The hormones absolutely support, but you can do a lot with diet and lifestyle. So first things first, you want to make sure that you are, these are my three, you know, meno laws for weight loss. Number one is you want to optimize your protein intake. Optimal protein intake is one gram per pound of ideal body weight. So if you are five foot five, your ideal body weight's 125. Now you may weigh 150, you may weigh 110, but you want to focus on ideal body weight. Okay. If there's seven grams of uh, protein in an ounce, then it works out probably to about 18 ounces a day, which is just over a pound of protein. So you figure, you know, five pounds, five ounces of protein, three meals a day, you're going to roughly hit your goals. Um, Number two, you want your protein ratios to be higher than your carbs. So that means if you're eating, and I recommend people just spend a week or two tracking in MyFitnessPal so you can just see what your numbers look like. 
or any free app you choose, um, if you're getting 125 grams of protein, then you want to make sure that it's higher than your carb intake. So maybe your carb intake should be, you know, 100, 110 grams. Most of us are overeating carbs anyway, unless you're really lifting weights and physio and physically active. Most of us are pretty sedentary and don't need as many carbs as we think. Okay, so already you're going to balance out your insulin levels, but you're also eating more protein and having less carbs than protein. That alone changes your brain biochemistry. It shuts off hunger in the brain when your blood sugar is balanced and when you're getting optimal protein. Most people can easily snarf down like a sleeve of Oreos, but nobody is binging on half a cow. Like you just, your brain signals fullness when you're eating a lot of protein. So your cravings go away, your serotonin, dopamine come up with high protein, especially in the morning at breakfast. So all of that immediately gets your eating and, and hunger under control. But the other thing it does is it really helps with sleep. And a lot of weight gain comes in perimenopause and menopause because of the sleep disruption from a decline in progesterone. So when you balance your blood sugar, it helps with sleep disruption. It helps control hot flashes much better. So all of those pieces come into play. And my favorite law of all is to eat carbs at night, have heavy protein during the day and have, you know, a cup of rice or, you know, beans or lentils with dinner or a sweet potato or white potato. Those will increase your insulin, but in doing so will decrease your cortisol. The two are antagonistic to each other. So in that state, you're actually going to conk out and sleep much better. <laughs> and when you sleep better, you correct a lot of insulin resistance and cravings that you get, you know, the night after a course, uh, after a night before sleep. Awesome. And then how does the microbiome change during menopause? Yeah. So as we discussed, the microbiome um, is going to be disrupted with a decrease in estrogen and progesterone because you can get um, you know, a total shift in the gut bacteria. If you have a decline in stomach acid, unhealthy bacteria can overgrow. Um, you can also get a thinning of the intestinal walls, making it semi-permeable. So you can get a leaky gut where undigested food is really passing back and forth across the gut wall. So all of that is very disruptive and can create a cascade of inflammation in the gut. Often I get a high histamine response from women going through perimenopause or menopause. I see very high levels of um, a bacteria called Morganella. And so, you know, they're getting all of a sudden like sinusitis and bad allergies and, you know, a lot of joint aches. So we really try to, again, optimize optimize that digestive uh, fire. Your stomach should be like a cauldron of acid, right? And we also want to optimize uh, stomach acid for bone density. You cannot absorb your trace minerals like calcium, boron, magnesium, and zinc, which are all very bone friendly. Um, if you don't have enough stomach acid in your or in acidic environment, having uh, in your intestinal tract. So all of those pieces really need to come into play. And, you know, it's so that is another reason why I like women to do early intervention when it comes to hormone replenishment, because that can really help rebalance the gut. One of the big pieces that you hit on that I think is really not quite talked about very much is the histamine that's happening um, when we hit menopause where people suddenly develop what, you, you know, sinusitis, they, de they develop allergies that they didn't have before, which they're like, what happened? Like, why am I so sensitive to suddenly name it uh, environmental um, allergies or more so, or airborne allergies or more so food allergies, et cetera. It really hits with the changing of hormones. Yeah, it really does. And again, uh, know that it's temporary. You can certainly take, you know, uh, some quercetin and nettles and turmeric 
to really get that inflammatory response down. You don't have to take like Claritin or Allegra, you know, those nutrients work equally well. Um, but you could also do, you know, a neti pot if you like every night, just, that's just a nice gentle nasal wash that you can back in the day, like you had to manually do it with a pot. Now there's all these nice gent machines that you just stick up your nose and they flush the water through your nasal cavities. Um, but you, again, once you rebalance your gut and you really put in, you know, good, healthy probiotics, butyrate. Uh, butyrate producers are also really beneficial for gut health and really the, allowing the bacteria and the gut to colonize. Um, those are also really beneficial. I love lots of red foods um, to help support acromantia, which is a really beneficial bacteria. So polyphenols, red grapes, um, um, pomegranate seeds, cherries, raspberries, strawberries, you know, those are also really, really beneficial to get in the diet. Those are like some of my most favorite probiotic foods and they're usually sweet, which I love too. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, this has been an amazing talk and I think it's really just bridged between hormones and gut and a, and a lot of issues that so many women are struggling with. So where can people find you and find your book? Yes. So I have a gift for your listeners today. Um, you can download my happy hormone cocktail. You go to estherblum.com forward slash cocktail, and you're going to get on the priority notification for my book release as well. So, and you can also follow me on Instagram at gorgeous Esther. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was just so fun to have you on today. Thanks, Amory. I appreciate you.